Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 21st, 2016, and my guest is author and journalist Chuck Klosterman. His latest book, which is the subject of today's conversation, is But What If We're Wrong? Thinking about the present as if it were the past. Chuck, welcome to Econ Talk. Hey, it's great to be here. So I want to start with the general question that runs through the book. Why are we so confident about so many things that are likely to to turn out to be incorrect? So there are really two parts to that question. Why is it that there are a lot of things that are going to be incorrect in the future, and yet we still think they're obviously true now? Well, I suppose maybe there's a two-sided answer to this. Part of the reason that we sort of exist in this world where we – live as if we are right about how we view reality, even though maybe in the abstract we'll be like, well, of course, in the future we'll think differently, but we're going to live as though we're right now. Part of that has to do out of necessity. Uh, This, you know, I had sort of the luxury of writing a book where I can think about these ideas and how people who are not yet born will look back on this time. I think for a lot of people, it would be sort of an impractical way to live, to sort of constantly be second-guessing every belief they have or everything that they assume to be true. There's a a, a certain utility in just working like, well, the way we view the world is how the world is. I think maybe the other more insidious problematic uh, reason is that as we've kind of democratized communication, and we have radically expanded the number of people who can be part of uh, conversations about politics and sports and culture and uh, you know all, uh, science and the economy, all these sort of big ideas. We've really increased the number of people who can be actively involved in the public discourse. Um, it has become much more difficult to sort of get attention in that specific kind of attention economy. So – What seems to have emerged is this idea is that expressing a high degree of certitude dovetails with some kind of authority. In other words, simply just having the confidence that you're right somehow gives your argument um, a a little more merit. And of course, as this has has proliferated, uh, it has had, you know, like the opposite effect in, in the sense that people act more confident about ideas that they themselves understand to be fragile and probably incorrect. Yeah, and I I may have remarked on this in the past on the program, but when somebody says something with total certainty to me, there's no doubt that blah, blah, blah. And I say, are you sure? They'll immediately back down. I'm thinking, well, and I'll find myself backing down if I say something, you know, hyperbolic about who's going to win the – in the World Series or which – who's going to win the presidential election or what this policy's effects are going to be. And, and you find yourself sometimes overconfidently stating something because, yeah, it gets attention and makes you feel good too, by the way. Um, and yet when someone well, – I'm a way of speaking. Yeah. It's, it's just, just like like you say how people back down when you bring this up. That doesn't surprise me. Um, it, it's – when the person says, okay, there's, you know, well, you know, there, there's no doubt that, uh, you know, whatever the case may be, they're not really saying I have zero doubt in this or the world has zero doubt. What they're basically just saying is I believe this and I want to make the statement stronger. Yeah, I want to put but this out there. It, <laughs> yeah, and because those ideas are really questioned, though, after a while there does seem to be this illusion, this sense that these things that are expressed to be without doubt, well, maybe they are. Maybe we just have to accept them. Maybe we just have to sort of unilaterally look at these things as kind of subjective truths, which is you know, kind of a paradox in itself. Yeah, but, oxymoron. You know. Yeah, there's an irony here, which, which I thought about a lot while I was reading the book, which is we live in a time of unprecedented access to information, unprecedented access to people's opinions about that information. And yet it seems, perhaps ironically, maybe it's not ironic, but it seems to me that it's it gets harder and harder to figure out what really is true. And the internet, which is this glorious 
information machine is in many ways making uh, navigating that th those challenges more challenging. Yeah, I mean, there's really two ways to look at this, I suppose. I mean, you could say that, well, the Internet is creating more avenues uh, for ideas. And that now that there is, uh, instead of having sort of only kind of canonical ideas or sort of one mainstream belief, we now have every possible idea existing in the world and people can access all of these ideas with the same degree of fluency. And you could think like, well, that's, this is really going to give us a better sense of what the world is like um, because you're hearing more voices. But at the same time, for the most part, people are kind of supporting the same general belief system. The same general ideas are just being repeated in lots of different ways. Yeah. And what they, that may do is actually make the things we think now harder to contradict later or harder to disprove later. I mean, if you go back to something, a belief from the late 1700s or whatever, you'll find you know, the idea expressed. You might find some critics of the idea you might find a little more information about the person who presented the idea. But that's pretty much it. For the most part, that idea can be reinterpreted because we have this limited amount of information about it. Now, every individual, every idea, every sort of concept that exists is remarked upon and analyzed and written about by so many people that it almost calcifies that perception. Like, I don't know if it'll be as easy to go back and reinterpret a novel from this period the way we can go back and interpret a novel from, you know, the early modernist period or whatever and say like, well, this means something different now. I don't know if that will be as easy because there's so much information about the present tense. Yeah, it's a really um, – I mean it's just a fascinating thing about your book is it really makes you think about uh, how much we know and how much we know that's – we think we know that's wrong. Um, I'm a big fan of humility and your book uh, did – did humble me a little bit, uh, even more, made me a little more humble than I like to think I am intellectually. So there's an incredible range of, of topics in the book, literature, rock music, physics, football, lots more. I want to start with, with science. Uh, 1600, you, you contrast uh, Brian Greene with um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, why is 1600 a possibly important date in thinking about whether science has it right or not? Well, I mean, this was that, – that's really the perception of Tyson, basically, when, you know, of the two guys – and it's kind of strange. I, I interviewed two scientists, and they're very high-profile scientists. So they're already sort of outside of the norm. They exist in this different world where their job really is to explain complicated ideas in a mainstream way. But in this, as it turned out, they kind of worked as, as like two good – uh, not necessarily adversaries, but no different foils. poles of this idea. Yeah. And, you know, Tyson's thing is that around 1600, a, a lot of important things happened. You know, the invention of the telescope, the invention of the microscope, but the main thing was sort of the adoption of the scientific method yep. as sort of the way we understand the world. Prior to this, science had probably had more of a relationship with philosophy than it did with math. Correct. And from 1600 on, it was different, okay? So he believes that, you know, this idea of paradigm shifts or the idea that maybe we'll believe something about the scientific world for hundreds of years and then shift our ideas completely, he argues that that is over, that the Copernican Revolution, all that, that was kind of the last time that's going to happen. And that from this point forward... All we're going to do is sort of hone the ideas we already have. We'll get a better understanding of how old you know the universe is or how gravity operates or any of these things, that, that there isn't going to be another big shift. Whereas Brian Greene was more like, well, it's really hard to argue that because the history of ideas basically is the history of people being wrong. And, you know, we would certainly not be the first generation of people to assume, well, this time we got it right. So they end up sort of being, you know, like the two ideas almost personified, one of which being like, well, you know, we've been wrong in the past. This time we are right and we're slowly getting better. Or we've been wrong in the past. We'll probably be wrong in the future. But there's no way of knowing that while we're still inside the system. Yeah, it's really. I, I had two thoughts 
Um, I'm more of a Brian Greene kind of guy. I, I had two, who's the skeptic, but I, I had two thoughts while I was reading that. One is ulcers. Uh, you know, we, we, were, we thought we understood that ulcers were related to stress, and it turns out it's uh, uh, a bug, right? Uh, a lot of things in medicine get reversed. A lot of things in uh, – now, of course, I assume Tyson's really talking about cosmology and physical science more than, say, certain types of applications. But then also I thought about plate tectonics. We really – that was uh, – you know, a shockingly ridiculous theory that, that oh, because Africa and South America look like they fit together. Well, actually, they probably did fit together. Or how the dinosaurs died. Those are things that happened way after 1600, where received wisdom got just sort of totally shocked, right? Oh, yeah, oh, how the dinosaurs lived. I mean, it, 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 how, as much as how they died. <laughs> but here's the thing. The, the, the question becomes these things that we just mentioned, you know, ulcers, plate tectonics the age of dinosaurs, all of these things. Those ideas have clearly changed. The question becomes, did they change in the way Tyson describes them, or did they change in the way that Green sort of speculates that they could change? In other words, is the idea that, you know, that we've, our understanding of ulcers now, is that t- taking a core idea and getting better and better and better and better at understanding it. In other words, like taking a, Taking the same general idea and just getting it Refining. to be more and more accurate, yeah. or are we reversing some thought that we thought, you know, like you know, there was a time not that long ago, you know, in Scandinavia, really not that long ago, where there were some people who were like, well, you know, the reason people get sick are, you know, we used to think it was, you know, gods, but now we know it's gnomes and trolls. Yeah, so now we have a favorite. much better understanding. <laughs> one yeah. of my favorite lines in the book, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and it's it, it now that to me is closer to the Brian Greene thinking this Absolutely. idea that that the big picture idea shifted. Um, yep. It's you know it's it's a bizarre thing though because it's like a you know I, I get asked you know you read a book like this you get interviewed about it and as I'm talking about this I feel myself almost hoping or expressing the idea that, like, I hope we're wrong because my book says we might be. <laughs> and I don't know if I smart, feel that way. How I smart think. you're going to look in 2,000 years. They're going <laughs> to well, say there was this one, one guy. Right. There was this one if guy, Chuck one. Klosterman. He was a genius. <laughs> he understood that thousands of years later. <laughs> the only thing is shame on you. have a lot of predictions. You know, people want predictions. Yes, and they I'm do. I'm not a big predictor of things. But when you write about the future, that's what they want. They want you to say, like, well, okay, this, uh, uh, you know, we we think it's going to be the Beatles. We think we're going to remember the Beatles. But nope, it's actually going to be Quiet Riot. And here's why. Like, that's what they want. Yep. Like, that's not really how this book works. Well, let's take the literature one because I was totally fascinated by that as a lover of fiction. Um, you were speculating in that chapter and sections of the book about – in 100 years, who will be seen as the great writer of this period? And the easy answer is somebody like Philip Roth or David Foster Wallace, somebody who has a reputation among the the elites, the academic world, as sort of being a, a great writer. It probably won't be Stephen King for that reason. It won't be J.K. Rowling. Uh, and you said it almost actually almost certainly won't be Philip Roth or David Foster Wallace or anyone like those folks that have a great reputation now. Explain why. Well, OK, this is the way I would describe it. If you had to pick someone, like if I was a gambling person and I was somehow gambling on the perception of the world in 100 years, those are the people I would pick as well. There would be the safest pick. However, uh, nothing about the way – sort of literary history has unspooled really suggests that this is how this works. I mean, the, the, the apex people tend to be writers who a future generation reinterprets their work to mean something else. Um, you know, that, that, that the greatness they experienced within their lifetime or sort of the, 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 you know, the value of their work uh, it's not that that uh, is false. It's just that what is viewed as great changes uh, very often with the changing definition of what is transgressive. Because it seems as though transgressive art is what, when we look back, seems the most important. People who had ideas 
that seemed to go against the idea of the culture um, were maybe unsettling at the time, they which ended up things. being closer to yes. They, well, even if they didn't necessarily change things, they uh, they were ahead of the curve of a change that was coming. Uh, that the way people thought about uh, you know uh, relationships or the way people thought about what the value of your life is or whatever, how these things. I use Moby Dick as this example. In this Great book example. Where, you know, yeah, when, when, I mean, it's kind of the, the best example where so Melville writes Moby Dick and he thinks it's going to be his sort of defining work and his, his masterpiece. And it gets mixed reviews and doesn't sell that great and it kind of ruins his life. <laughs> and it isn't until long after he's dead, after World War I, that the book is sort of rediscovered, not just as like a good book, but as the book. Like this is the, like, this is the great American novel and essentially has become the template for the idea of the great American novel. So the question became what changed, right? Well, you can give specific examples of things that may have changed. Guys coming back from World War I, you know, maybe this is the idea of, of fighting a faceless enemy somehow resonated with the idea of, you know, this faceless whale and the com camaraderie between sailors and the camaraderie between soldiers and the need to know all this obscure information that, you know, Moby Dick has chapters on making rope and stuff like that. You go to a war, you learn how to take your rifle apart, all of these things. But this is kind of a sense of reverse engineering. Yeah. Uh, what has happened is the book was in many ways arbitrarily selected and not that it's not great, just that it's the book that got picked. And there were other great books that could have but didn't. And then we have to sort of explain why. So when I think of 100 years from now, kind of using the same logic, what someone's going to do is they're going to take a book out of this period, and its greatness is going to be uh, found in these future people's ability to basically take their life, whatever their life is like, and see fragments in it in this book. So the downside to someone like Philip Roth or David Foster Wallace or Jonathan Franzen or DeLillo or Pynchon or any of these people have is we've spent a lot of time already deducing what these books mean. Like we've had many, many, many public discussions and so much writing and so much analysis of what these books mean that it's going to be hard for someone in the future to say, well, actually, it was about this other thing that's happening now. So the people who, have, who are actually have the best chance of seeming very important in 100 years are kind of blank slates. People who have written books that are either generally unread entirely or are read but not taken seriously so that in the future when these books are rediscovered, the meaning that they have can be kind of invented by these different people. But we can't reinvent you know, what Philip Roth wrote about. Like, there's an understanding of what those books are now. You see what I mean? Sort yeah, absolutely. Of? It's like, no, it's a brilliant it, insight. There, there, there's, there's a weird advantage to being um, unheralded in your time. Because if you are, that sort of becomes the meaning of your work. But if you're unheralded and kind of unknown, it's really open to the people who want to care later. Well, let's take another example you get, which I, I loved, um, which – you, you imagine that there was a television show in ancient Egypt that we come across. Uh, it takes a leap of the imagination. You, you recognize that there you know, probably wasn't that much electricity in ancient Egypt and broadcasting was pretty um, embryonic. But imagine that we found the tapes of that show. What would we do with them? And then you use that to imagine what people in the future will look back on the age of television – uh, to understand our cultures. Talk about that, because that was really rather extraordinary. Okay, well, so the idea is that, that I work with is like, obviously, this is impossible, but let's say we found out the Egyptians had television. We, it, it makes no sense how this could have worked, but let's say that they did. And we have all the tapes. So everything that was on television in ancient Egypt, we suddenly possess. Well, what would be interesting to us? Well, you know, it wouldn't be whatever they classified as their best shows, whatever they, you know, if there was some ancient, you know, uh, uh, blogger, blogger. <laughs> yes, yes. We, 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 we would be interested in news and sports, nonfiction programming. And of the fictional material, what we'd be looking for is a way to understand what life in Egypt was like through that show. In other words, we wouldn't care so much what, 
they thought was the most entertaining, we wouldn't be watching it for entertainment value. We'd be looking at it like an anthropologist. Yep. What allows us to see what the Egyptian world was like? And I tried to apply that to the age of television. I assume, just because of the way technology works, that television will probably be kind of like not going to disappear overnight, but I don't think in a hundred years we'll have the same relationship to TV we have now. I think it'll be replaced by something else. And TV will sort of be a dead medium, but we'll have access to all of those shows digitally and on film. So when somebody in this future time wants to go back and examine television, what will be interesting to them? Well, I don't think it'll be shows like Mad Men and The Sopranos and Breaking Bad and you know, Game of Thrones and all of these shows that we consider to be, you know, artistic successes, and they are. But what they'll want to see is a way to understand the world almost accidentally. In other words, TV shows that had what I call ancillary verisimilitude, shows that ended up being real, not because that was their intention. Like it wasn't like the showrunner was saying, "I want to make the realest show possible." The showrunner just thought they were going to make a television show and accidentally created this kind of transparent sense of reality. And that's sort of how I worked through this problem and sort of came to the conclusion that I think it might be a show like Roseanne, where, you know, it was a, it, it aired during a time when the perception of TV was pretty low. Nobody really thought it was art the way they do now. Um, it wasn't any, it, we were not in any golden age of television or anything like that. Um, the motive of the show was just to succeed, be a popular kind of network sitcom. But there were all these little details within the program uh, that I don't even think were intentional, but give us an actual sense of what a family living in America in the kind of lower middle class during the late 80s or early 90s, what that would be like. Um, now, what does that tell us? Does it tell us that Roseanne's a better show than we think? Does it mean that? I don't know what it means in some sense. I just think it's interesting. No, it's really interesting. I love your point that reality TV would be the last place you'd look, even though you think, well, hey, what could be more real than that? But, of course, it's not very real. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, in a sense, it's, yeah, the, the, the word reality TV is the problem. I mean, the people going on reality programming now, understand what they're doing. They understand that this is not really an attempt to show a documentary of what life is like, but they are supposed to embrace character types and that there's certain kind of conversations and conflicts they're supposed to have. So what they're really doing is just acting without a script. So of course it seems extra fake. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you're flipping, if you're flipping through programs on your, you know, the remote control, you know immediately when you've slid across some reality television. Like it, the way it looks, the way the people talk, it looks less real than scripted TV. Yep. It's just it's funny. It's like I, I mentioned like MTV's The Real World. Uh, kind of the, 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 the counterintuitive success of that show is based around its title and how there was immediate recognition that this is – the complete opposite of what you're seeing. It should have been called <laughs> like the unreal world. seeing the real world. Yeah. The surreal yeah, world. but that wouldn't have worked. <laughs> if they had called it that, it would have never succeeded. Yeah. So let's talk briefly about music. You spent – there's a long discussion of it. It's it's absolutely fascinating. But I, the part I found really interesting to start with was this idea that uh, – turning to my audience, uh, I'll ask the question, uh, how many people can you name who wrote marches? Uh, the kind of music you'd hear at a parade, at a football game, and you point out that the answer is one, and that's John Philip Sousa. And you suggest, and it's a little bit of a stretch, but you suggest that, say, 300 years from now, we think about, say, rock music, that if someone wanted to evoke the last half of the of the uh, 20th century musically, they're only going to be maybe one representative of that kind of music. We, what, what seems to happen is this. And now, when, when, I, when I forward this idea, I'm not saying that, that there aren't exceptions. There are, of course. But for the most part, everything, whether it's music, film, books, whatever the subject may be, 
culture seems to operate like this over time. You start with a huge field of potential candidates. You know, there are many people who could be seen as really central to the existence of that art form. And then time plods along. And as time plods along, certain candidates drop by the wayside. They get lost or they disappear or their relevance changes. And eventually you get down to only one artist remaining. And then the significance of that artist is kind of amplified and exaggerated. And that person ends up becoming interchangeable with the art form. John Philip Sousa being this example, that there were many people creating marches. And now we have a form of music we all vaguely understand. I think even, you know, the average seven year old kid knows when they hear marching music that that, you know, they're at a parade or they're you know, they're they're at a football game or whatever the case may be. But if we go on the street and you ask people who made marching music, name marching composers, 99% will either name nobody or just Sousa. He has become the idea itself. So you apply that to rock music, which is seems impossible, right? Rock music has been so popular for so long, really along with television, probably the biggest cultural influence of the 20th century. There are so many kind of key artists, um, but the same thing is going to happen, that you know, we're going to move forward and artists are going to just disappear from people's radar. It's already happening now. So who will be the one person who ends up becoming uh, the epitome of this? Well, the, 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 in a rational world, that answer would be the Beatles. But we don't live in a rational world. It's going to happen for other more capricious, more arbitrary motives. And I kind of try to work through this chapter saying like, well, how will this work? Like if, you know, uh, why will people disappear and, and, and who might remain and what will be the reasons that they remain? And of course, you make you make a semi prediction. We don't have to. We can leave it for the excitement of the readers to, to find it. But the part that makes this interesting, as you mentioned earlier, even though people want predictions, what I found more interesting was how you thought about making a guess or a gamble or a bet on who it might be. Um, you didn't mention Eric Clapton, by the way. He would be a my group of people that might qualify. You mentioned about five or six uh, that, that might make it. And your point that the Beatles, even though they're incredibly successful and are not just like successful, they're considered artistically successful as well, not just financially successful, makes them a, 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 pos a strong possibility, but it very well might not be them, and it could be lots of, lots of other people, uh, yeah, lots of other groups. Here's, here's, here's one, another kind of possibility. There's another possibility that the Beatles might end up becoming more remembered than rock music itself. That for whatever reason, the way that the music resonates with kids and sort of the way it, it sort of uh, kind of built the culture of the last half of the 20th century, the Beatles as characters might be what exists. And rock music is only remembered as the ancillary thing of what the Beatles did. Yeah. Like rock music matters because the Beatles did it, not the other way around. There's also, I think, a possibility that the things that we'll remember about rock music won't be individuals. It'll just be tropes. It'll just be qualities of what we think rock music is supposed to represent. You know, a, a sense of lawless, lawlessness and something you know, kind of simple blues based music and rebellion. music that was, yeah, rebellion and music that was kind of invented by black people and co-opted or stolen by white people, you know? So then it's just all these different kind of qualities, which will then be applied to whoever seems to best fit that, puzzle. It's it's just I, I think the way that history works is just pretty fascinating because it's it it's almost as though we knowingly live in a way that contradicts the way we suspect it will end up being constructed. It just it's just I don't know. I, I'm not a historian but I love thinking about well, it. Well part of it is we don't want to think about that, like you said earlier. It's just it's just too it's something dissident about that 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 I say love uh, the Beatles. I don't, but suppose I love the Beatles. Well, of course they're going to be the one. It's like, just like I want my friends to like the Beatles. I want my great, 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 great grandchildren. They'll think the same as I do. So there's a certain kind of um, desire, which Adam Smith mentions. We'll get a little economics in here directly, that, that we want people to like what we like and dislike what we dislike. So if I tell you that, um, uh, that ABBA is an awful music group, it would it would jar me if you thought they were great. So the same thing I think is true down through through the generations. But I have a puzzle for you, which is which you don't mention in the book, which is the following. 
And by the way, for listeners who are thinking, well, come on, you tell me the Rolling Stones won't be remembered, the Doors, the Who, the Van Morris, Elvis Presley, come on, they're all going to be remembered. The answer is, yeah, who's remembered before 1950? Who, who, who captures, what artists can you think of who were important in American music between 1900 and 1950? I, I happen to like that era a lot. I can name a bunch, but I think most people could name one. That well, be- you, you already can, it, this is already visible when you start talking to any person really under the age of 50, yep. about jazz. Yep. I mean, jazz was a real important thing in the history of the United States. You look at Ken Burns' jazz documentary and all these things, you know, it's like uh, it, was, it was incredibly central to the black experience, all of these things. Um, and the number of famous jazz musicians now, it might be Three? down to 10. Two, yeah, it's a yeah. handful. Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, three, I guess it's real famous, but I mean, like, but I, you know, Finding somebody who can name 10 jazz musicians, that's possible. Finding somebody who can name 25, you're probably talking to somebody who uh, scholar. is <laughs> a scholar or, Crazy. or just or, or a big, like a real invested fan. Yeah, an, like a somebody nerd. who A jazz yeah. fan, a huge oh. jazz fan. But, uh, but before so 1950, in the non-jazz world, in the popular music sphere, it's, it's Frank Sinatra and it's nobody else. I mean, I happen to love Ella Fitzgerald and... Sarah Vaughan, and, and I, I like Tony Bennett, and I like uh, Billy Eckstein, but outside of people who really care, it's one. <laughs> so anyway, here's the puzzle, though. In the, in the literary reputation discussion, you say it's going to be somebody we've never heard of, uh, probably, not necessarily, but probably, who can be reinterpreted. Why is it that in the music debate of 300 years from now, you think it will be somebody who was extremely famous and successful, just not necessarily the one that we would think of now? Well, that's a good question. Part of it has to do um, with the inherent tie that popular music and particularly rock music has to youth culture and that, that it's, uh, you know, books have sort of existed, uh, you know, or, the, or, or what we sort of use as a loose way of describing a book. You know, for, for really since since the, the dawn of complicated thought, and that 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 books uh, aren't expected sort of to, to the success of a book is not dependent on it having an impact on the world at large. In popular music, it's very very difficult to be an important musician uh, with no audience. I mean, you look at something like, okay, a record like, I don't know, Trout Mask Rec- Replica or something. Some of these records from the 70s that critics know about, but no one bought, who still have not, you know, like it's a, or a Frank Zappa album or something like that. That's a good I, example. I, mean, I, suppose, I suppose it is possible that, uh, you know, over time, those things could emerge and become sort of the stand for what rock, rock music was. But also, if that were to happen, it would suggest something about rock music that would be kind of profoundly untrue, which is that it was fundamentally an experimental art form. You know, if, if Trout Mass Replica is the example, or Frank Zappa, is, or Frank Zappa is the example of what music, rock music supposedly was, it would seem, it would be, it would be beyond wrong. I mean, you talk about maybe we're wrong. That would be like it would be maybe the wrongest way to think about what rock music was. And literature is not really like that as much. I mean, the, the thing I say about books is that it seems very plausible. There's there there are like you know kind of three easy you know kinds of candidates for this. There are people who that we expect to be great. There's people who we don't know at all. And then there's that third category of people who we know of but don't take that seriously. Actually, the Herman Melvilles of now. I mean, Melville was a commercially successful writer. He was made a living doing it. He just wasn't seen as being transcendent. That class actually might be um, best positioned for this because their books will have been popular enough or, or proliferant enough and in libraries enough that people will be able to find them. Um, but the idea of them having a very clear meaning or what their importance is, that will be still kind of up for debate. Well, I just want to take the opportunity to say Peaches on Regalia, which you don't get to say very often on this program for you Zappa fans out there. So I don't think that that's three words have ever been uh, said in a row. Uh, and have, I think have I have you that. Seen the, uh, have you seen the new Frank Zappa documentary? No. You must be a fan. 
No. Oh, I just, I just saw it a couple of weeks ago. Is it ago. good? It's pretty interesting. It's just a collection of his interviews, basically, with some of his music. Um, I find his music very difficult to listen to, to listen to, but uh, so that complicates the experience of watching the documentary. You know, Peaches and Regalia is pretty good. If I've got the title right, I, I'm not cheating. I'm, I hope it's right. But the other point I thought I had when talking about these differences is that uh, what is still talked about in literature, it's extremely ephemeral. Uh, people whose reputation was, you know, someone like Somerset Mom, who was, you know, incredibly well regarded when he was alive and I think is probably less so now, or Hemingway, uh, who was a giant in his lifetime and I think now is, I'm not sure people are going to read him in, in 100 years except in in English classes, maybe. Um, a lot of that reputation comes from the academy. I feel like it comes less from the academy in the music world. It comes more from something else, the culture writ large. Is that true? Well, I mean, yeah, there's less of an academy for one thing, although I will also say that is changing. Um, the idea of music right. criticism has become, particularly in the last 15 years, 10 years, more of an academic. More scholarly, pursuit. yeah. It's um, true. Yeah, but uh, uh, certainly from like, you know, I mean, it, it's, just, it's just kind of weird to think about this. Okay, so so the first album that was rock record that was really taken seriously by like the mainstream media was Sgt. Pepper. Okay. So that's 1967. And yet our, what we view now as the most important phase of rock in many ways is basically like 55 to 65 or 66. So this incredibly important period, it's importance comes from what it isn't clear. You're right. It's not like, it's not like there's some academic source telling us this. It kind of happened naturally, um, which is also part of the way, part of the reason why artists from that period, um, will always be seen as sort of, uh, the most important foundational uh, creators of this yeah. art form. It's like we talk about presidents or whatever, you know, we, the, 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 the list of the great presidents is constantly shuffled. Okay. Every year we go through this. We, you know, we, we, you know, when I was in college, Grant was the worst president. Now it's Buchanan. You know, it's like FDR seems to kind of be creeping up the list higher and higher. Uh, Lyndon Johnson used to be sort of in the middle of the pack. Now he's higher. However, the very top of the presidential list is always going to be Washington and Lincoln and Jefferson. And, you know, and these you know, the, the people that, that have been at the top forever because they sort of create the definition of what a good president is like. Like a good president now is seen as somebody who seems to embody and represent what Washington and Lincoln did. It's the same way in rock music. I mean, there can't really be a rock band greater than the Beatles because they essentially invented how the we believe rock, rock band. bands yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like how there's how they're supposed to interact, how they're supposed to be, how, you know, like everything, you know, well, um, what's good about the Beatles music is what's good about rock music now in a lot of ways. Uh, so, uh, there are some things that are hard to change simply because they create the definition. So I want to shift gears, um, and I want to move to sports, which, um, you have some very provocative things to say. You start off by making a, I think a very deep point that, a lot of people have predicted that football's not going to – National Football League is going to die. It's too violent. Uh, players are apparently being um, harmed physically in, in very possibly deeply disturbing ways through their cognitive abilities being degraded by concussions. And the NFL's responded. They've tried to to make the game a little bit safer. It's just – it's not clear whether it's going to make it. And the – Standard view by many is that, well, over time, people aren't going to want their kids playing football. You hear former football players, stars saying, I wouldn't, you know, my kid's going to be a baseball player or a soccer player. I'm not going to let him play football. I don't want that to happen to them. Uh, I want to be able to walk and think and et cetera, et cetera. And so a lot of people predict football is going to die off. And you pose, you make the great observation that it actually might thrive uh, a lot more by becoming more violent. Explain. Yeah, well, I mean, right now there seems to be, like, two baseline perspectives on the future of football. One, as you said, the game is doomed. The other is that, well, it's too big to fail. It's too central to our culture now. It's too central to 
American life, so they'll just tweak the game and they'll adjust the game until uh, it's the level of violence is brought down to an acceptable level. But I sort of see two other possibilities because, you know, we might be wrong about these two things that seem sensible. One is that I can imagine football becoming significantly less popular but socially more important because it will come to represent a certain kind of ideology that for the most part has been removed from the way we think about life. I mean, you know, it's uh, uh, the idea of physicality in life, which was a, a real central part for most Americans through really the 50s. Most of human history. Um, you know, uh, Yes, I mean, you know, from exactly, you know, uh, and now that that's kind of been taken away, but it still exists in football. So uh, it also seems as though a lot of the ideas that we would view that that have become to be viewed as unenlightened and troubling, the idea that oh, the the ability to intimidate someone is a value, or that masculinity is prioritized in any sense. Or that you can yell at someone in order to get results. All of these things. I'd add, and I'd add, I'd add suffering. The idea that you have to be punished yes. physically to 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 be go through a crucible that changes you and makes you a better player or a better person. Yes, oh, and also in, in that that the rules governing these games are extremely strict and 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 kind of inflexible and don't really seem to be impacted by the changes in society. These things. Um, in most of society, are tr are, we're trying to remove those ideas. So there's this one place where it still exists and where it still flourishes. And I can imagine people that, as, that it might become a political idea. Like, for example, the Republican National Convention is happening right now. I could easily imagine if a convention like that were happening at a time when – People were trying to say ban high school football in the state of Ohio or ban high school football in, in you know Alabama or something, where they would be like, "We are against this. This is part of the problem. This idea, that, you know, and and even if football maybe loses two thirds of its audience, the third still watching it." would care about it in a much deeper way, and it would actually become more popular. The violence of the game is what would save it because there's no other place for that to exist in society. Yeah, it's, it's an incredibly deep point, and I um, reminded me of my childhood. I grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts. My father was uh, raised in the South. I was born in the South, but, but my parents grew up there, and my dad – found himself in Lexington, kind of a fish out of water. And uh, Frisbee became very popular. And my dad didn't like Frisbee. <laughs> and I just couldn't understand like, why he like, didn't like, like it. Like Ultimate Frisbee? No, no, this is, no it, took, no, it took a while for Ultimate Frisbee to be invented. This is just th tossing a Frisbee because he viewed it as an anti-sport. He viewed it as anti-competitive. I thought he was crazy, but he wasn't crazy. Uh, like many things, uh, I thought he was wrong, but he wasn't. Uh, he had an insight there. He might not have been right about Frisbee, but he was right that it was, in some sense, a statement. Parents wanted their kids in Lexington to play Frisbee because it was not competitive. It was not physical. There was not uh, two-a-day, uh, four-hour, uh, intense workouts without water to transform your uh, soul and make you a great Frisbee player, as there was with, say, football. And, well, and that that sentiment still exists right now with with soccer. Of that course, there is a there is a meaning to being a soccer proponent. It means that you're more of a global thinker, and that the kind of the reactionary uh, uh, sense that, that football represents or whatever, like you're against that. Like when the the cities where soccer tends to be have been embraced uh, tend to have. Uh, a political ideology that aligns with that. A different sensibility. And, and, and even ultimate Frisbee, which is competitive, right? Uh, there's no contact. It's, it's a very different kind of sport. And, you know, one way to say it, which you don't say in the book, but you alluded to a minute ago, is, is it's, it's not as physical and it's not as masculine in the traditional definition because that word is, 
is dying. That whole idea that there's anything virtuous about masculinity, whether it's the physicality of it or other parts of it, our culture is rejecting that relentlessly, which means, as you point out, I think correctly, that things that still accept it or embrace it, football being the most one of the most dramatic examples, there are others, but football being the most, might become a bastion for contrarians as a way to express themselves. And I, I just think that's a really interesting idea. I mean, I think that's very true, exactly what you said. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's go to Coco. Uh, you were – not the drink, but the uh, animal. Y- you were the ethicist at the New York Times Sunday Magazine for three years, which is in itself a fascinating uh, thing. Uh, talk about Coco and uh, animals versus people. Yeah, you know, I, I got this letter when I was the ethicist, and for those who don't know what this is, it was like it was a column in the New York Times Magazine where I, I, I mean, I, I though I would, I, I always hated when people made this comparison. I suppose it was a little bit like Dear Abby or Ann Landers, except people were writing in problems that were ethically based. And yep. I was supposed to sort of deduce what's the most ethical conclusion to this problem. And somebody asked a question that on the surface seemed really kind of preposterous. It was that after Robin Williams had committed suicide, they went to this gorilla, uh, Coco the gorilla, I believe in the Cincinnati Zoo, uh, speaks of sign language, is, 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 is very extremely intelligent. At some uh, level, gorilla. yeah. Speaks yes, in sign language has, at some level, yeah. whatever that means. We don't has, really know. Has a relate has a relationship with her owners that somehow seems, or I guess it's not owners, but keepers that kind of seems to transcend the normal human animal relationship. And they tell they tell Coco, who had met Robin Williams many years ago, that Robin Williams had come to the zoo and they had interacted and had a great time. They tell this gorilla, hey, that guy you met, you know, 11 years ago or whatever, Robin Williams has died. He committed suicide. And Coco cried and was very depressed. Now, the person was like the, asking the question in the, to the ethicist was like, well, what's the point of telling a gorilla this? You're only going to, you know, upset it. Why would, you know, what, isn't it unethical to tell a gorilla something that you know will make it sad or whatever? Now, that question is sort of interesting, but the larger question comes this idea of, like, is this even possible? Is it possible that that this gorilla could somehow have an emotional response to the news that a celebrity actor has committed suicide? Because it would – if it did, it would mean many things. It would mean that that, that gorilla – you know, you apes – sort of have a recall for every person or thing they encounter? Would it mean that they that, that Coco would have somehow sensed something about Robin Williams, that she knew he was a different kind of individual, even though she'd have no sense of celebrity? Do gorillas know they're going to die? Do they know what death is? All of these things. And while I was answering this question, which I just found kind of fun and, and just really sort of compelling, I talked to... Uh, kind of a, a specialist, a veterinary specialist about this. And what his response was, you know, an ape has the cognitive ability of, say, a three-year-old or a four-year-old, but that's not what you need to think about. What you need to think about is the fact that animals might have a greater emotional intelligence than humans than humans do, and that, that he would, in his indica- his argument is that we're constantly learning that animals do seem to have a greater sense of emotional intelligence than people. Now, emotional intelligence seems, in general. It seems like a stretch, but it's, pos- well, I don't know it's if possible. It's, I mean, it could be a possible. I mean, the, here's the deal. In the 1980s, we were having this conversation in the 1980s. The whole idea of emotional intelligence, we'd probably kind of scoff at. That was something you would see in Cosmopolitan magazine. That's just the idea that somehow there was an intelligence to your emotions in the same way that there's an intelligence scholastically. Well, that's not the case anymore. Now, everyone kind of agrees that emotional intelligence is a real thing. Yeah, they and could be wrong, Chuck, too. Well, we, what? <laughs> they could be wrong about it too. But go ahead. Let's, they they like, could be. But I'm just saying that, that it's it's we have now come to sort of generally take the idea of emotional intelligence much more seriously than we used to. Well, let's say this keeps going. Let's say that in 50 years, it's not that we just recognize that emotional intelligence exists, but we actually see it as more important than scholastic intelligence, and that is uh, that that that. An understanding of of 
empathy and all of these things is actually the most meaningful way to understand how smart someone is. And at the same time, this idea that animals have greater emotional intelligence than us becomes more and more verifiable. So we believe emotional intelligence is important and we agree that animals have more of it than we do. Well, that would really paint a strange portrait of society. Because obviously humans are continuing, we're going to dominate society. It's not like we're going to turn it over to the animals. We're not going to be like we're going to elect a cat president or whatever. But we have this strange situation where we would have to concede that animals are both our slaves and more intelligent than us. It's um, really interesting to think about. Uh, we'd almost certainly stop eating them, I think. And we may stop eating them anyway, but – uh, that part would be just the beginning, uh, as you say. It would just it would kind of upend in many ways. And the part that that ties into this that that I think is important as well is that human intelligence may turn out to be seen as less and less uh, relevant as artificial intelligence grows, and so that you know, many people have argued. I'm sympathetic to the idea that empathy will be a much more valuable skill in 25 years, say, than it is now. That to be human, to, to be the non-intellectual part of our humanity, our heart rather than our mind is going to be valued much more than it is now relative to the mind, our heart will be. And that does raise the possibility that animals that are, say, loyal, like just thinking about a dog that we kind of, I'm ashamed to say, I kind of look down on because he's always glad to see me. Uh, regardless of, of what else has happened in the day or how I've treated him. Uh, I don't actually have a dog. It's hypothetical. But that idea that somehow dogs are uh, – it's it, that's a pleasant trait for dog owners. But what if it came to be seen as not just a pleasant trait but so much more important, as you say, than than our, say, ability to do calculus because eh, we're not going to need that. Machines are going to do all the calculating uh, or I mean, math. It's, it's kind of wild. It's thing. I I mentioned this in the book, sort of book, the idea of rote memorization, you know, because I, I talk about Bob Dylan and how there's uh, in Bob Dylan's autobiography at one point, he kind of makes a passing reference to the fact that the reason, you know, he likes to, re you know, record songs that have 16 verses or whatever is mm -hmm. like, he's like, well, you know, there's just something enriching about memorizing things, you know, <laughs> of course, he was born in like 1946 or whatever, whatever he was born. So he was raised during a time when rote memorization was still a big part of school. Now, I went to school in the 70s and 80s. Okay, By the time I got there, rote memorization had been profoundly reduced. There was yep. this, I had to memorize like the preamble, you know, for the most part, it just wasn't a thing anymore. Now I think there's almost none of it. Like the idea of, of kids memorizing anything is seen as almost superfluous. Anti-intellectual, actually. Yes, you know. Um, you know, so... But that has, you know, that changes sort of what the meaning of intelligence is. I mean, I would, I grew up to believe, and 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 I'm not saying this belief is right, but it was how I believed. It was like intelligence meant you knew about things that you didn't have necessarily firsthand experience of. Like anybody can read the paper and know what's going on right now. A smart person knew about what happened before they were born. A smart person knew about films that they hadn't yet seen because they predated and they went back and saw them. If you really liked sports, it wasn't enough to just know who's good now. You had to know sort of about Jim Brown and Wilt Chamberlain and all these people, you know. That seems to – we've moved away from that, it seems like. That there, that there is now almost this belief that all of that kind of information has been uh, kind of curated and is – built into our computer. We don't need to know these things anymore. It's a waste of time to know things that aren't right in front of you. You can always go back and find them. Um, that changes what it means to be smart to me in a way that I don't know how comfortable I'm with. Uh, not because I can really argue that my way was better. I just don't know if I like the different way it is now. And little prophets that an idle king by this still hearth among these barren crags matched with an aged wife. I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race that hoards and feeds and sleeps and knows not me. And I think I got that right. That's the opening of the poem Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson that Miss Kinnean made me memorize in the eighth grade. And I can go on. I don't know the, remember the whole thing, but I can do the ending, which I get goosebumps every time I, I say it. Um, and I'm not going to do that, but – uh, it's an interesting question as to whether rote memorization of certain things is 
a bad thing. I I love what I have memorized. Uh, yeah, I love that it's, it's the thing you just did though. Now that's kind of a bar trick. Yeah, it is. Somebody would say to you, "It's like what's okay? What's the utility of that?" And it's a hard thing to answer. It's hard to say why memorizing something, what utility that has, but. I don't know. I mean, I remember in high school when we learned algebra, of course, you would say, like, why do I need to know this? And the argument was very often, well, you don't need to know specifically this. You need to know how to think. Like, this, like algebra helps you how to think and, and, and to sort of understand ideas that aren't visually clear or visually obvious. You know, it's like a... Um, is, was that true? I guess I probably argued against it at the time. Now, as I'm older, it seems makes, but that's how it always is. No, but I, it's like, I, I think that misses something else, though, which is that if I have a desire to uh, know what the opening of the poem Ulysses is, I don't need to have memorized it. I can find it right away. The virtue of the memorizing, it isn't, oh, I helped put some grooves down in my brain. The virtue is, is that the poem Ulysses, the idea of heroism, the idea of an old warrior uh, near death, which is what that poem is about, reminiscing about his youth and trying to stave off death and reviewing his life. That, that concept is so much more salient to me because I've memorized it, not just because I've heard of it. And I think to tap into that is that, is that value. And I think one of the reasons that music is so powerful in our lives, pop music, is because Rhyme and music help us memorize things. We're much more likely to memorize the lyrics of songs now than a poem, for obvious reasons, and certainly than a passage in a book. And uh, so it's more relevant to our lives in a lot of ways, just, I think, for that reason. I, I mean, it, it could be. At the same time, I mean, you gave the you, – you opened that poem and you described it, you know, you, you – you were memorized. You told me what you remembered, you know, and it kind of went over my mind. Then you describe what it was later. Was the second description more helpful? I I don't know. I, I mean, it, for you it wasn't. For me it was. But my understanding of this is shallow. Your understanding is deeper. I think that there probably is a depth to memorization that is hard to quantify. But yeah, that's no, just know, an interesting I, question. Uh, well, we're almost out of time, and you know there are a lot of other things I wanted to talk about, which is a shame, but such is life uh, at Econ Talk. Um, I want to close with a question you raised at the end of the book, which is whether this matters at all. Um, there are a lot of wacky ideas in the book, much even perhaps wackier than um, that animals are smarter than we are in the emotional sense and that that will turn out to be decisive. Uh, you, you speculate on whether – this we're in the middle of a simulation and we're not really living reality the way we think we are, that there are multiple universes, that the Constitution could turn out to be a mistake. So you speculate that many of our deeply held beliefs might turn out to be wrong. And then you raise the question, having talked about all those things and all the ones we've talked about with, with great uh, zest and style, you say, uh, well, does this matter? I mean, who cares if we're right about gravity? For example, you, you speculate about Maybe gravity will be different the way we think about gravity. Gravity's not going to be different, but the way we think about gravity in 500 years might might be really different than we think about it now. Or maybe we'll – who's considered a great writer is going to, going to change a lot. One response to this entire book, uh, which you confront, is, well, yeah, who cares? I mean, it's not going to change anything. So what if plate tectonics are real? So what if – uh, Philip Roth's going to be forgotten and the Beatles aren't going to make it in 500 years. What, what difference does it make? Yeah, you know, I, I was on this book tour. The, the last event was in Portland. And after the event, one person said exactly that. They came up after after the talk and they were like, hey, I really enjoyed your talk, but I do have, you know, one question. An like, awkward question. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like, who cares if this is true? It's like they they're, they're basically were ask, asking like, why did you need to write this book? And, you know, my answer to that, I think, probably unsatisfying to them, maybe unsatisfying to people who listen to this podcast, but, like, to me, if something is interesting and entertaining, that's enough. Like, I don't need to feel as though every extension of my creative life 
has a real practical purpose, I probably wouldn't have pursued writing if that was the case. I would have pursued something different. Sure. Like, you know, my the way I view it is this. It's like, it's amazing that we're alive and that, that the experience of life is crazy. It's crazy that it's happened. It's crazy it's happening to all of us. I, I just think the world is an amazing thing. So to me, it's like the most fundamental question that I can ask is what does it mean to be alive? Is this really happening? What, what, all these things I'm having, these thoughts I'm having, why am I having them? So I pursue what's interesting to me. I don't say to myself, I gotta find something that uh, will change the world or that is necessary or that is critical. I'm just not like that. Like I'm not, I'm not criticizing people who view the world through that lens. I don't. I mean, I just think to myself, it's like, boy, my whole life I've been unconsciously wondering if what we know about the world is right or if it's all an illusion. Maybe I never had the language to describe it or to explain it to other people. But now I'm 44, and now I do. Now I sort of understand the question I've unconsciously been asking myself, and I'm going to take this ball of yarn in my mind and, like, straighten out the string. <laughs> and that, to me, what the writing is. So, you know, maybe, maybe we are wrong about the world, and maybe it doesn't matter if we're wrong. That's not my concern. I'm just trying to bring up the idea that this is a real possibility and that we shouldn't live life just saying to ourselves, like, well, that's how it is. That doesn't matter either. Like, I, I don't know. I, I, I... I don't know if that's a real cogent answer, but that's how I feel. It's like, to me, whether or not this matters is secondary. Well, as a reader who spent a few hours in trying every page, uh, which doesn't happen very often, you certainly changed those hours for me and made me think about a lot of things. And in the book, you mentioned wonder, and I think your book has a lot of wonder, and I think appreciating the wondrousness of reality and the puzzle of it is uh, very much worthwhile. Well, thank you very much. My guest today has been Chuck Klosterman. Chuck, uh, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.